Welcome back to Your Health Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon and I'm very pleased that you could join us for our next segment. Our next guest is the distinguished Dr. Leland Rosenblum, board certified ophthalmologist, specialist in the globe, the eyeball, surgery of the eye. Dr. Rosenblum, thanks so very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Dr. Rosenblum, before we get on to a very important topic, which I'm fascinated with, which is cataracts, I want to go over briefly uh, your training and what it takes to be an ophthalmologist. Um, sure. Uh, so ophthalmologists are uh, medical doctors. We go through four years of college and four years of medical school, uh, followed by a general medical training, and then typically three to four years of sub subspecialty training in eyes and eye surgery. Okay, so that's so after the medical after medical school, after college and medical school and general medical training or surgical internship, you do just learning and working and studying and experimenting with the eyeball and surrounding structures for three to four years. Correct. Okay. So you guys are experts in the eyeball and the surrounding structures. Absolutely. Terrific. So let's get right down to work and teach me and teach our audience. Cataracts, incredibly common, I believe. Very common. And incredibly important to know about and treat because it seems like you guys have made huge strides in treating cataracts in the past few years and people can get dramatic improvement with proper care. Absolutely. So let's start at the beginning. Teach me, please, exactly what is a cataract? Well, a, a cataract is um, a natural a clouding, uh, sorry, a clouding of the natural lenses inside the eye. So we are all born with a natural lens inside the eye. And if you'll pardon me, I'm gonna hold up a little eye model. Um, but inside the eye right here, we have a natural lens. And this lens is born, we're born with it, and it's clear. As we get older, this lens can cloud. Uh, and as this lens gets cloudy, it can affect how light is focused inside the eye. So to understand vision, we have to think of the eye as a camera. Light is coming in through here, it's being focused through this lens, and going into the back of the eye on the retina. So if we have a cloudy lens here, it affects how light can be focused inside the eye like a camera with a cloudy lens. So it'd be like your camera trying to take a picture of us with a cloudy lens. It wouldn't work too well. Okay, Dr. Rosenblum, this is fascinating. Now, I tell you what, before you put that model sure. away, what, what I'd like to do is just briefly teach the audience about the, the different major anatomic parts of the eyeball. Now, now isn't, isn't the cornea that's on the outside, that's what we look at, look at when we look at somebody's eyeball, right? That's what we yeah, see. I, I think that's a great idea to give a, a, a quick summary. So this is the very front covering the eye, which we call the cornea. It's a clear protective window. And it's our first contact with the world, basically. Okay, so, so that's what we can actually see and touch. That's uh, you can touch it, you actually can't see it. What you're seeing actually is the colored part of the eye right behind the cornea, which is the iris. So the cornea vaults like a clear protective dome over the iris. So you're seeing the eye color through this clear, transparent cornea. Okay. And then once light, go light goes through this central opening in the iris, we call that the pupil. That's the dark center that we see. And then right behind this iris is the lens. So light is going through the pupil, passing through the lens that we hope is transparent, and then has to go through the eye and hit this back of the eye, which is this area of light-sensitive cells, which we call the retina. Okay, perfect. Now, now I know we're here to talk about cataracts, mm -hmm. but, I, but I have a question for sure. you. I, we need the cornea to be crystal clear, correct? Right? I mean, not, no pun intended, Yes. but that needs to be absolutely crystal clear. Are there conditions that can affect how clear the cornea is? Absolutely. But that's not a cataract. Correct, that's not a cataract. So there are conditions where the cornea can cloud or develop scar tissue or growths can occur over it. Things are very common, uh, some sun exposure growths like we call pterygia, you, you may see people with wings of tissue sort of growing across their eye here. That's very common in um, sunny California. Okay, so we have the cornea, we mm -hmm. have the, the iris, mm -hmm. which surrounds the pupil, the yep. opening is the pupil, uh -huh. and in back of that is the lens. Absolutely. And in this discussion about cataracts, it's that lens in back of the iris we're gonna talk about. Correct, so you know, we're talking about this structure right here, which is the normally clear human lens. Okay, 
Dr. Rosenbluth, teach me one more thing, if you don't mind. Okay. What do we mean by the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber? Now, aren't those significant terms? Sure. So the anterior chamber is actually the area between the cornea and the iris. So we talked about the cornea vaulting over the iris like a dome. And that area between the cornea and the iris is called the anterior chamber. This whole back area behind the lens but in front of the retina is called the posterior chamber. Okay. Now, now, is there a space or is there a chamber between the, the lens itself and the iris? Or, or does that, is the lens sort of in contact with the iris? The iris is very close to the human lens, um, but not actually rubbing on it in most conditions. There's a small area there, a very small area. Okay, perfect. So when we, t once again, I just want to, to be clear to our audience, when we're talking about cataracts, it's that lens that's inside the eyeball. Correct, we're talking about the natural lens which ex that exists inside every human eye. Okay, perfect. So w you're gonna teach me how we get there when there's a problem with the lens, right? Yes. When there's a cataract, you're gonna teach me, hopefully before the end of the <laughs> segment, how we get there. But in the meantime, how does someone know that they have cataracts? What are the, si are, are there symptoms or are they just have to go to the eye doctor and to be told you have cataracts? Well, I mean, the most common symptoms of cataract would be blurry, or bl blurry vision, cloudy vision, or dim vision. Um, we live in a society where everyone drives. You might start to notice more glare when you drive at night. Um, you might see some halos around headlights. Um, thing, colors may not be as bright or as uh, saturated as they used to be, particularly blues and greens. You may have difficulty picking out different shades of grays or determining black from blue. Um, most people will describe a cataract kind of like looking through the dirty windshield of the car. So uh, things just aren't quite as clear as they used to be. Okay, so, so Dr. Rosenblum, typically we think of a more in mature individual or a senior citizen having cataracts, but just for a sake of c complete discussion, can't children or babies have a cataract? Absolutely, so cataracts can develop at any age. Uh, by far the most common cause of cataract is aging. But uh, babies can actually be born with cataracts. We give them a different term. We call those congenital cataracts. And congenital cataracts can pr prevent uh, babies from seeing well and can be a source of very severe vision loss if not treated. Okay, so almost any condition or disease that we talk about in this program, people want to know, how do I prevent getting that? How do I prevent getting cancer? How do I prevent getting hypertension? Is there a way to prevent getting cataracts? Well, the cataract prevention story is not a great one. So we don't have a lot of ways to prevent cataracts. Um, uh, we know that the sun uh, or ultraviolet light, the harmful sun rays are causative. So one of the things that you can do is wear some sunglasses or glasses with ultraviolet protection. But there are no medications that we can prescribe. There are no eye drops that I can give you. There's no magic pill that you can take um, that can prevent cataracts from forming. Uh, there have been some studies out there which have proven small benefit of certain kinds of eye drops, but larger studies really haven't shown those to be of any benefit. People say, well, if the lens is aging or becoming cloudy, what if I take all these antioxidant vitamins? That will help prevent aging. Uh, but antioxidant vitamins have not shown to be of any conclusive benefit for cataract prevention whatsoever. Okay, well, Dr. Rosenblum, if my grandmother and my mother or my father had a cataract, does that mean um, I'm more likely to get a cataract? Certainly, family history is a, is a major risk factor for cataract formation, um, but perhaps the greatest risk factor is just living longer. And okay. we are living longer and healthier as a society. Okay, so if a person gets to a certain point where something needs to be done. Actually, that's, I just, I just led myself to another good question. Okay. When do you decide or when do you advise a patient to do something about a cataract? Well, I often have patients come into my office and say, Dr. Rosenblum, um, I was told to wait till my cataracts are ripe. Are my cataracts ripe? And r ripe cataract is a term from perhaps uh, at least a generation ago when cataract surgery was not as accurate or the outcomes as good. We used to wait for cataracts to be very, very, very advanced before doing surgery. Uh, nowadays, it's really a question of lifestyle. So when your vision starts to give you trouble, driving a car, 
or performing the activities of daily living that you love. Maybe that's golfing, maybe that's watching TV, maybe that's reading. Uh, when it starts to affect that quality of life in a meaningful way, then we consider it time for cataract surgery. Okay, so something that fascinates me is when you advise a patient that they've gotten to the stage where they could be helped by a cataract operation, mm -hmm. I'm fascinated with learning about how we get there. How do you actually do the operation to, are, are you gonna remove that lens and replace it? Are you gonna take that lens out and buff it up and clean it and put it back in? What, what are you gonna do to take care of that cataract? Well, you know, we talk about, um, we talk about when we need cataract surgery and what cataract surgery involves actually is removing the clouded lens and replacing it with a artificial implant. And that artificial implant lens can be made of a variety of different materials uh, typically plastic or acrylic or silicone. Uh, but what we're doing during cataract surgery is we are removing the clouded lens and in most, if not all cases, replacing it with a clear artificial lens. Okay. Well, Dr. Rosenblum, I hope this is not too bizarre a question, but in the history of cataract repairs, cataract surgery, has anyone ever tried to remove the lens and fix it or repair it or buff it up or polish it and then put it back in? No. No one's ever tried to do that. No, because the lens itself is physically clouded. So the lens is composed of proteins, which our bodies are all made of. And when these proteins oxidize, they get clouded. And we don't know any way to wash those cloudy proteins away. You just can't. Okay, so, so, it, so it's not just like the surface of it needs to be cleaned or polished. Mm -hmm. It's the actual structure of the lens itself that's just not yeah, clear. So the enough. lens is formed of proteins which are called crystalline proteins. And as those proteins oxidize, they will turn yellow or white. Okay. As they turn yellow or white, uh, they become more opaque and then that's the cataract. Okay. But we can't, we can't wash that away. We can't remove it and inject something in there and then put it back in. Okay, so it's more than just the surface being scratched or cloudy. It's the actual structure of the lens. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so you, so you replace that. Mm -hmm. well, well, let's talk about the mechanics of the operation, if we can. H how do you, how do you get in there inside? That's, you're actually inside the eyeball. Yeah, well, 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 obviously first what needs to be done is an eye exam to make sure that cataracts are the source of vision loss and not something else that we might have talked about like cloudy cornea or other conditions like macular degeneration. Um, so it's very important to have an eye exam, obviously, to make sure that's the cause. Assuming that that's the cause, then appropriate counseling for surgery. Uh, before surgery, we do a variety of measurements because our outcomes are dependent upon these measurements. We measure the lens very precisely with a laser. Now, we measure, actually measure the whole eye with a laser. We used to do it with ultrasound, but our practice, we've been doing it for a laser for at least a decade. And with those precise shape measurements and length measurements of the eye, we can choose an implant lens which is uniquely suited to each individual. And the process of doing that really helps us in reducing people's dependence on glasses after surgery. So there's a lot of preoperative stuff that we have to go through and talk about before we even make it to surgery. Um, surgery is typically done on an outpatient basis. That means you're not gonna spend a night in the hospital. You're not gonna be put completely to sleep. You're gonna get a mild sedative. Um, you're gonna get your eye thoroughly cleansed and washed. You're gonna lie flat on your back. It's not gonna be a painful process at all. In fact, most people just say they see some lights, feel some pressure and motion. There's really no pain at all, pain at all after the anesthetic is administered. Um, place a sterile covering over the eye and then we can get into the nuts and bolts of surgery itself. So I'll, I'm gonna pause for my eye model here, but to get into the eye, um, we have to make an incision right here in the wall of the eye. An old style cataract surgery, they used to have to make very, very big incisions and then you would express the lens in its entirety. So old incisions used to be very, very large. Nowadays, we're able to do it through an incision which is about two millimeters wide, that's it, it's two millimeters. And these two millimeter wide incisions are so small that actually they seal themselves. So we don't need to use sutures, or anything in most cases. So it's like a little trap door that's created and once the eye repressurizes after surgery, boom, that trap door is closed and it will not open again. So these small two millimeter incisions really speed recovery. So after surgery, we don't have to have the activity restrictions you may have heard about your grandmother where she was in the hospital for six days with sandbags and couldn't move. Most people can resume their normal activities uh, certainly within the week after surgery and some people, you know, as soon as a few days after surgery with, you know, a few restrictions. You don't want to rub your eye, 
Um, you want to be careful about lifting heavy things, and you, know, you probably don't want to go swimming, you know, immerse your face in the swimming pool. But you know, most other things, you can, re you can resume your activities very, very quickly. Uh, the physical part of the surgery is uh, with, through that small incision, we insert a special probe inside the eye, which is called a phacal emulsification probe. And that probe has finely tuned ultrasound in it and suction. And we use the ultrasound to break apart the lens into small pieces of a pie, very small pieces. So think about a pie, and then we divide it into eight segments. And when it's divided into eight segments, you can suck out each of those segments through a very, very small incision. So we can keep this incision very small. And then after we've vacuumed out the lens, then we have to replace it. So now that we have these very small incisions, well, we have to have lenses that are, can fold up through that incision. So I brought a, this is not the actual size of a lens, but this is a model of what a typical implant lens would look like. This is actually uh, an acrylic one. And what this lens would do is we would put it in a special device and it would fold up like a taco, imagine like a taco, uh, like a little round taco, and then we would unfold it through that small incision and it would unfold and place inside the eye. So we're able to, because these lenses can fold up, we can keep the incision very, very small, two millimeters. And that really speeds vi visual recovery and it speeds um, how well people can see after surgery and it also creates better outcomes because we can not alter the shape of the eye as much as we did if we had a very large incision. Okay. Dr. Rosenblum, that's fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to invite you back because we don't have very much time left, but I, we do have time to answer a couple questions briefly. Now, do people have choices or do you have choices as to what lens you recommend goes back in? D or does everybody get the same type of lens to go in? No, so uh, one of the great progresses that has been made with cataract surgery is we now have choices with implant lenses. So we have lenses that are considered monofocal, those work at one distance, and you could say choose to have good distance vision and then wear glasses for computer or reading. Um, but we also have implant lenses now that can work not only for distance but for close as well. And when those implant lenses are placed in both eyes, you know, 80 to 90 percent of people can be free of spectacles for most of their activities of daily living. You may have also heard of another condition called astigmatism where the eye is curved much more in one direction than the other. And we have implant lenses now that can actually correct or compensate for that too. So that discussion has to be individualized with patient counseling ahead of time. Amazing. Dr. Rosenblum, uh, it's, this is fascinating to me and you're a terrific teacher. I need you to come on the program again. Before we transition to our next segment, I want to give out your name again and your address and phone number and if you have your website. Dr. Leland Rosenblum, you are a board certified ophthalmologist. You're an expert in cataract surgery and conditions and diseases of the eyeball mm -hmm. itself. And do you have an address and phone number and or website sure. we can give out? Sure, I have two offices, uh, one in Monterey and one in Salinas. Um, the phone number you should contact me at is 831-372-1500. And if you're looking for a website, that would be www.montereybayeyecenter.com. Excellent, Dr. Leland Rosenblum, board certified ophthalmologist, expert in cataracts and medicine and surgery of the eyeball, 831-372-1500. Yes. Fascinating. I hope you come on the program again. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Once again, this is Your Health television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. We're going to take one more very brief pause for a very good cause.